Christ has found Daniel really, really challenging every step of the way. Because um, we're not just going to look at Daniel Lyons, and we're actually going to look a little bit before that briefly. Um, and through Daniel's whole story, I, I'm just not sure I would have had the strength and the courage and the faith that Daniel did. And so every time I'm reading it, I, I just I keep looking at it going, ah, but that's not me. And oh, I wouldn't have done that. Oh, I just, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know? And so it was very challenging to me. If you don't know the story of Daniel beforehand, um, I think Daniel the Lion's Den is one of those stories that a lot of different people know. But when Daniel was 11 or 12 years old, uh, Babylon defeated Jerusalem. Now that's a really nice historical way to say that Babylon came in and did something unspeakably tragic. Babylon defeated Jerusalem is the same as the USA defeated the Axis at Normandy, right? So Babylon defeated Jerusalem also means that Babylon came in and killed a lot of people. Babylon defeated Jerusalem means that Babylon came in and knocked down the walls of the city. They burned the temple. They took the most important people of the city and took them out of the city. They exiled the people. So Daniel's whole identity from the age of birth up until 11, 12 years old when this happened, his whole identity was in the people, the land, the temple, the worship. And just pretty much like that, although it happened over the course of a little bit, but very quickly all of that is just stripped from him. And he's got none of that. He doesn't have the temple to worship in anymore. He doesn't have the sacrificial system anymore. He lost a whole bunch of family and a whole bunch of friends, more than likely, because, again, Babylon came in and destroyed them, killed them. So he has nothing of that. Neither does Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the ones that we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or as my Sunday school teacher used to call them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I don't know why. Rack, Shack, and Benny, if you're a um, Veggie Tales guy. So all of those were contemporaries, and they, you know, went together out of the land. And immediately they were given a choice. They could accept the re-education, assimilation, and Babylonian culture, which is what that whole uh, Daniel plan is about. It's what that Daniel uh, meal, you know, the, 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 what's the word looking for? The, Fast. Fast. The, yeah, the Daniel and his friends fasted. Um, and uh, the rest of them didn't. Um, I can't come up with it. But anyway, that's what that whole Daniel thing is about. Uh, Daniel menu. Daniel, Daniel diet. diet. Thank you. That's what that whole Daniel diet is about, actually, is that the Babylonians were trying to assimilate them and trying to make them one of their own and stuff like that. So they had this immediate choice. They could either accept all of that or they could stand apart. And that is what they do, is they choose to stand apart. They faithfully, they boldly follow their faith, and they decided, no, we're not going to become Babylonian. We're not going to uh, engage in their worship. We're not going to engage in their food. We're not going to uh, be assimilated into their culture. We're going to stand apart. We're going to remain Israelites. We're going to continue to worship the only God that we know, and we're going to do that despite and in, in, uh, in defiance, actually, of this other culture. That's us, by the way. We don't belong here. We're exiles. We're strangers. We're aliens. We're foreigners. Scripture calls us all kinds of different things like that. But I'm already convicted. I am. Their whole world, everything they had known, was taken from them but there's not a hint of bitterness. Much like Joseph. Daniel was promised, or sorry, promoted and essentially became uh, counselor to the king. The enemy king. The king that was responsible for burning the temple, tearing down the walls, killing the people. He became counselor for that fellow. And again, I'm convicted. Because Daniel made it his mission to serve and to bless that king. 
it would have been so much easier from that position to have sabotaged that king. Daniel realized that if ever going to see home again, nothing is ever going to be the same again. And he gave himself to be a faithful steward to the foreigner and a faithful, bold follower of God. And I'm convicted. By my own weakness, by my own limitations, by my own tendencies to fit in rather than stand out. As I said, Daniel describes our life. We are in exile. We are not at home. We have choices to make about how we obey God, about how we show what He is like, about who and how we serve and what we do to bless, about how to live as a faithful steward to those we've been given to serve, and how to live as a faithful, bold follower of our God. And we haven't even gotten to the lion's den yet. But let's get there. Chapter 6. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps. I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing that right. But it's think of them as presidents, <coughs> leaders, to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. So you get this? The new king comes in and says, because it's a new king because of things that also happen, already happened to Daniel, but it's a new king, comes in, says, okay, I need some leaders over the people. I'm going to pick 120 of them, and then over those 120, I'm going to pick three, and of those three, one was Daniel. So Daniel is way high up in this administration. But here was the, what they were supposed to do. The satraps were made accountable to them, to those three, so that the king might not suffer loss. Again, it's such a perfect place for sabotage. It's such a perfect place for, oh, I'll show you loss. I mean, look at those words. I mean, if you have your Bibles open. So that the king might not suffer loss. What had Daniel experienced? Loss at the hands of this king. So why isn't he going after this king? Why is he trying to prevent loss for this king who made him lose everything. There's no bitterness. In fact, Daniel becomes known for his faith and his service. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or anything, but I'll just confess that there have been times in my life where everything has changed despite, you know, uh, I, I did nothing, but, but stuff just happens. And everything is different from that point forward, right? You know the kind of moments I mean. And this kind of faith is not my first resort. I mean, some of you know the story. Uh, Nicole would have been 14 today. And when I learned that she was uh, going to be born with terminal birth defects, I quit. I told God I was done. That was my first response was, okay. I just won't do this anymore. Now, God graciously intervened, and, and I repented, and, and God did some amazing things to her life. But my initial response was not this. So I read this, and it's just, it's just hard. Verse 3, as I said, instead of bitterness, instead of sabotage, Daniel became known for his faith and service. Verse 3 says, Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Forget this 3 and 120 thing. He's going to be second. He's going to be Joseph. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. And finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Do I need to say it again? Again, I'm convicted. Not because I'm not trustworthy, I think I am. Not because I am negligent, I don't think I am. But because the only way they could successfully attack Daniel was through his faith. There's a lot of ways to attack me that are far more successful than through my faith. That's, that, you know, that's why this story is, every, every phrase almost, it's like, not this. Most people are shocked by uh, the fact that Daniel 
is uh, how do you picture Daniel in the lion's den? Twenty. Huh? Fourteen. How old are you? Thirteen. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to ask Melissa how old she is when she says twenty, but... <laughs> I always picture him in his thirties. I always picture him in his thirty, maybe forty. I always kind of picture him as, you know, you know, strong and able to take care of the line. I mean, do you know how old he actually is? He's eighty. He's 80-some years old. He has lived in Babylon for 60-some years. He hasn't seen home. He hasn't had the comforts of temple worship. Um, he's, he's had nothing of his childhood traditional um, ways of expressing his faith for 60 years. 60 years without the most traditional forms of worship. So I'm going to turn it on you just a little bit. If we couldn't gather here publicly, do you think that the way you work would be enough for people to see God? Because again, that's what was in Daniel's life. Do you think that the way that you get up in the morning, uh, do all your stuff, drive to work, clock in, and the way that you do your work, do you think that that would be enough for people to see God? I hope so. I really do. I hope so for me. But in this, in this story, you know, Israel can no longer say, come to the temple, look at our songs, look at our sacrifices, listen to our teachers. You can see what God is like. That can't happen anymore. All they have is their lives. And God wants people to see him through the everyday stuff. God wants other people to see him through the way that you and I behave. And again, I'm convicted. If for nothing else than the way I drive. And I don't mean that I'm a bad driver. I mean that I'm the guy that is upset at the bad drivers around me. Because, let's face it, everyone around us is idiots. Right? You're the only one driving well. I think it was a comedian that first said that an idiot is anyone driving faster than you are. And a moron is anyone driving slower than you are. If for no other reason than the way I drive, I'm, I'm convicted. Verse 6. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. That's always a good way to start something. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Number one, it's a lie because not everybody agreed because Daniel wasn't in on it. Verse 8, Now your majesty issued the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. So you get this, right? The law is, for the next 30 days, you can only pray to me as the king. Now when Daniel learned the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room, and where the windows opened toward Jerusalem, three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Okay. You got a law that says I can't pray to anybody but the king? I'm not going to do that. But I'm also not going to hide. I'm not going to change anything. I'm going to keep doing what I had been doing before, which is going upstairs to my room and getting on my knees in front of an open window and praying toward Jerusalem. By the way, the reason he was praying toward Jerusalem, and I won't read it all, but if you want to look it up sometime, 1 Kings 8 is when Solomon dedicates the temple, and there's this very lengthy prayer. And during this lengthy prayer, Solomon says over and over again things like, uh, if your people are ever taken captive, and if your people are ever driven from their land, and if they pray toward their land, may you hear and answer them. 
if the sin of the people ever causes the crops to fail, if the sin of the people ever dot, 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 they pray toward your land, toward Jerusalem. May you hear and answer their prayer. So he's fulfilling uh, scripture. And one of the things that was, uh, one of the other preachers I was listening to on this passage was talking about how what is actually going on here is not that Daniel is like, I'm just going to do what I was doing before. Part of what he's doing is Daniel realizes, I can't do what I was doing before if I'm not praying. Daniel didn't just think I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. The reality was I can't do what I was doing without the praying. I can't be wise. I can't rule over this kingdom. I can't rule over these 120 satraps. I can't rule over all these other people. I can't uh, fight my own bitterness. I can't, you know, etc., etc. Without this thing that I've been doing, without these three prayers that I've been doing. I can't do this without God's help. I can't serve this king without God's help. I'm not the leader you think I am without God's help. I have to pray. I don't have any other hope for leading the way I lead apart from God. And so Daniel prayed three times a day. He went to his room, he closed the door, and he prayed. And they're probably not short prayers. This is probably like a season of prayer. Three times a day for enough time where he was known as the guy who did that. You see that? He was known for this. So, again, flip it. Could you have done that? I don't know about you, but every piece of me would have been like, okay, I'm still praying. I'm not going to pray the king because I've been totally wrong. But I can at least shut the window. Jerusalem's still that way. It's just like, I can't see it anyway. Just hide a little bit. You know what I mean? So again, I say, and I'm convicted. If I knew there was a law against the practices of Christianity that I faithfully practice, let me think about this. If you knew there was a law against the forms of your faith that you faithfully practice, would anything change? Some people honestly would, because they're not doing much anyway. Others of us, we, we do it, but we hide. See, like I said, it just it just convicted over and over and over again. And it and maybe the other stories would have too if I had been listening more closely. But um, I, I just gotta confess to you that, that God's been at work in in me and. Um, recognizing that I thought about how to put this and I, and I just you're just going to have to put up with my stumbling for a second here we have these questions that we've been using to try to help you to get to the gospel who is God what's he done who are we and what do we do and what I've realized is that I have shortened that and I have not gone over here to what do you do very often I actually have stayed more on the who are you in Christ, which is really important. And as often as we need to, which is every week, we're going to come back to those three. But I want to begin laying uh, more faithfully side by side both of those. Who you are in Christ because of what he's done. But that changes us. That makes a difference. That, that, that challenges us, that, that draws something out of us. And I have not been very faithful to put that before me. I knew that was happening. I, I, I knew God was kind of leading me that direction. I think part of it was just uh, a natural progression because you, you have to have that base, which we've had for five, six, nine months or whatever it's been of, of who you are in Christ and what he's done. So I, I, part of it was natural, but I, I knew God was moving me more toward that, more toward mission, more toward challenging you more.
to do with your faith what we aren't doing at the moment. And then I had a conversation with one of you, and the word that was used was that I was downplaying the example of the Old Testament, and he's right. That loving conversation was absolutely on target. The reality is that downplaying the example of these Old Testament people is easier because otherwise we get humbled by stuff like this. None of us like to be humbled. So as I said, let me just back up for a second before we can move forward. And uh, lest the wind blow away everything from last week, <clears throat> we talked about this big arc that we've been in, creation, fall, redemption, recreation, recreation rather. And um, we talked about that uh, we live in a world where God constantly pursues the fallen. And that is important and vital and beautiful because we are fallen. When we see our own failures and incompleteness and honest struggle, we can remember and trust and take hope in the promise that God is always moving toward us. He moves toward us in our weakness and in our failures so that when we read stories like this and when there is sharp conviction, when there is, wait a minute, I, I'm not sure that I pray three times a day, let alone once a day some days, let alone three times a day when it might cost me my life to pray three times a day. You know what I'm saying? So when we get that sharp conviction on a story like this, God is moving toward that. God is moving towards you in your weakness. What I didn't get to last week was that God's pursuit ends in spectacular fashion. It ends in the promise of God to reconcile us to himself. It ends in the promise of God to give us eternity. It ends in the promise of God to defeat sin and temptation and hurt and heartache and pain and sorrow and grief. Do you know the scripture says we will mock death? There's, there's a scripture that says that when these things occur, that we will look at death and say, oh, death, where is your sting? Do you know? I mean, am I... Okay, I see some nods. Okay, so hold on to that for a second. If we're... I've seen death. I deal with death. It's not pretty. The idea that we can mock that, the idea that we can stand over that is powerful to me. But think about it. If we're going to mock death, then that means we will also mock everything less than death. It means that all the stuff that you and I drag around daily that we wish we didn't drag around, someday we will stand over it and we will mock that. Because if I can mock death, then I can mock, I don't know, thoughts that I shouldn't think. If I can mock death someday, then I can mock um, bitterness, unforgiveness. If I can mock death, then I can mock Everything less than that. And that's not just hope. That is a guarantee by the blood of Jesus' hope. That is what gives me hope to believe that all this is true, that God is moving toward us and pursuing us and transforming us. As we talked about last week, yes, this Christian life is difficult. It's uphill and against the wind. It's not easy, but it is worth it. The society, the pressures around us, the weaknesses in us, it is rarely easy to obey God. It is rarely easy to do what we see here in Daniel. It's never actually easy to see what we do see here in Daniel. But it's worth it. If Daniel knew that better than I did, it's worth it to risk, to be bold, to be uncompromising, to look at the best parts of these Old Testament people and be inspired and strengthened. Verse 11. We're going to come back to these thoughts. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asked God for him and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? And the king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, hmm, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. And when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. 
He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. That part of the story is always fascinating me. There's a hole there that is not filled yet for me. I just want to remind you, again, that God is moving toward you when you can't pray once a day, let alone three times a day, let alone three times a day when it might cost you your life to do it. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And then the king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. And then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating, without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Oh my goodness, if I was Daniel, I would have just been quiet for a minute. <laughs> right? And by the way, does this remind you of anything? Dawn, rock rolled over a big hole in the ground. Somebody coming to that place, wondering if anybody is alive, actually figuring that nobody there is alive. Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. As I said, this does sound familiar. Jesus was in exile. Jesus left his home. He wasn't kicked out. He left his home. There was a rumor that sought unsuccessfully to deliver him before finally giving him to the enemies to kill. Jesus' body was placed in a pit. Jesus died, though innocent. No angel to close that lion's mouth but an angel to roll the stone away. Or at least sit on the stone once the stone was rolled away. Now we can see that the power that allows us to risk all for our faith. Jesus has not only gone to the lion's den and emerged unscathed, he has died and been raised again. I'm going to read it again in just a second, but uh, King Darius puts out another decree and it says this, For he, the God of Daniel, is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed, his dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves, he performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Verse 23 says, The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. So it wasn't just that the lions weren't hungry. And then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language and all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the mouth of the lion. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. There is a reality to these stories that I, I, I can't leave. Um, in Hebrews 11, it talks about Daniel being an example of faith. It says that by faith, the mouths of lions were shut. And by faith, 
All these miraculous, wonderful, powerful things happen. And then if you read very carefully near the end of Hebrews 11, it also says, by faith, men lived in caves instead of in homes. Men were cut in two. Men and women were given two lions. So there's a reality to these kinds of stories that has to be noticed, and that is that when we obey fully, when we obey faithfully, when we do these things that we're called to do, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything turns out happy by our standards. But it does remind us that he's worth it. It reminds us that God uses obedience. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And Cyrus was the one that was moved by God to allow the people to come back to Israel to rebuild the temple. Israel is brought home, kings are brought to God. It's, it's just a, an outgrowth of what Daniel did. Oh. So here's what I want to ask you to do. I've done the best that I can to, 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 to lay out the story. Daniel and the lion's dead. Everybody knows the story. I, I've reminded at least myself Hopefully through my stumbling words, I've reminded you of, of the many, many ways that we don't quite measure up to everything that Daniel calls us to. And I reminded you that Jesus perfectly fulfills this story. And that because we are in Christ, he challenges us and He draws out of us something greater than what we have yet experienced. So I just want to ask you to do something. And it could be any number of things. Let me give you some examples. So why don't you close your head, close your heads, close your eyes, bow your heads, and just listen to me for a second. Um, I want to challenge you to uh, so maybe three times a day of prayer, if that's not something you already practice. It's easiest uh, probably to do that first thing in the morning, although for some people, you know, you just, you get up and you go, you're out. But at some point during the morning, at some point during the afternoon, at some point during the evening, just take a few minutes and pray. But, but here's where I want this message to be different. Here's where I, I want my life to be different. Here's where I want fields to be different. So I'm challenging you to pray three times a day if you don't already do that. So if you get through Monday and Tuesday and you've prayed three times a day and you're feeling pretty good about things, and then Wednesday comes along and you forget it, I just want to remind you that God moves toward that weakness. I just want to remind you that when you are boldly obeying, when you're doing something that you haven't done before, when you decide to tithe and you've never tithed before, when you are struggling through trying to forgive somebody and it's just not feeling it yet, when you are continuing to struggle through some kind of bitterness, when you are challenging yourself to some level of obedience that you have not yet, and it's just, you, you still feel short, like you could have prayed longer, you could have done, you know, whatever. Yeah, you could have. But instead of retreating, as I often did, into shame and into uh, disappointment and into, well, I guess I can't do that and giving up, remember that because of Jesus, God is rushing towards you in that weakness. Paul actually said, and I am going to study it because next year we're going to look at uh, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, unless God changes my mind. And Paul actually says 
that he boasted in his weakness so that Christ's power would rest on him. So there's some connection between acknowledging our weakness and Christ's power resting on us. And that is way different than I grew up here. So I just want to challenge you to, you know, pray three times a day. Um, I want to challenge you to, we didn't talk about it, but uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel were contemporaries, and surely their faith uh, fed each other's faith. Um, so challenge you to feed somebody else's faith this week. Challenge you to stand apart. Challenge you to go to work and work as if it truly is for Jesus. And in every place that you feel like you didn't quite get there, just remember that God is rushing towards you in that weakness. And you can boast in that weakness and defeat and receive his strength. It's actually in 2 Corinthians, but when we do, uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, we'll get there. So Father God, I feel... Um,